over the main. We're recording it so that we can put it on. So we're going to discuss initially with a case presentation from family basis. The main stages are management by neurology, which we were glad also to have neurology, uh, palliative management of uh, advanced dementia with the palliative care team, behavioral disturbance, which also is very common. This is one of the most common, probably, admissions from patients to the facility from ALF, nursing home. 10 to 30% of the patient population with advanced dementia, they develop different behavioral disturbances. Uh, we are going to also invite the speech and follow evaluation by the speech and follow uh, program for here and some ethical issues in dementia by also pediatric care. So, uh, with the uh, fellow from um, family dementia, can we see the Perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Shavna Singh. I'm PGY1 from Family Medicine. All of these people were involved in making these presentations, and Dr. Modi is over here with us. Um, so, for our presentation, um, all right, we're going to talk about one of our patients who came to us on November 7th, 2022. She came to us from a nursing home. She's well known to us um, by ambulance at in the afternoon for acute dystonia. So while in the ER, the patient was completely nonverbal. Um, her vital signs showed a little bit of hypertension, some tachycardia, temperature, and SpO2 was fine. So we did the imaging. We looked at her head. We did a CT of the head. We did a chest x-ray at the ER and they were both normal. Um, in the ER, we were, she started on um, IV sodium chloride, so normal saline, or half normal um, at 75 ml an hour. So this is essentially how her chest x-ray looks like. Um, and then you can see there's like no focal uh, consolidation, <clears throat> any focal infusions or anything acute going on over here. Huh? And then this was the uh, report for the CT brain. Oh, you, okay. know, you know, the um, on the Zoom, it's not showing the directions for some reason. Yeah, I think we did the full screen. We didn't share the full screen. Yeah. yeah. No, it's not. It's not. No, I didn't share the full screen. One second. It's still on the first slide. Let me, share. Oh. Let me share the full screen version. That should be. Okay, but, uh, well. Now, Dr. Michelle? And now it's perfect, yeah. Okay, okay. okay so this is Thanks. what the x-ray looks like in the ER. Um, no focal consolidation, no acute, um, any infectious process going on. Okay, the next one. And this was the report for the CT brain. Again, we were just wondering because she suddenly became like nonverbal. She was just showing signs of acute dystonia. So a CT brain was done. Again, no CT evidence of acute intracranial hemorrhage or any midline shift or mass effect. So completely um, normal. They did see some chronic sinus diseases, but other than that, nothing. Sorry. So initial presentation. So while she was at the ER, you know, we tried to do the awake and alert and orient, but she was awake, she was alert, but she wasn't oriented, not even to herself. She doesn't engage with us. Um, she was, you know, showed generalized muscle hypertonicity and rigidity. Um, and she had pseudotrismus. Essentially, her jaw was so tight it wouldn't open. And she had clenched fists, her elbows were flexed, her legs were extended. Um, she showed pain and even passive motion and refused us trying to like move her in any form. Um, on the left side, left hand, the skin um, showed some mild warmth and redness, but it was completely not tender, just a little bit of um, irritation. And she had muscle bracing as well. She was bed bound prior to the admission. Um, and here she's bed bound as well. But now this time we were noticing some acute like muscle wasting. Um, and we looked for pressure ulcers. There were no pressure ulcers as well. Okay, so those were her initial labs. The pertinent things um, are basically the fact that her hemoglobin is 10.9, her UA was done. Um, we can see that she had like 
squamous epithelial cells, um, as well as some bacteria and leukocyte esterase positive, but she, she's well known to us in the nursing home and we know that she has chronic retention. Anyway, so that wasn't super concerning to us. Um, yeah. All right, so these were all her medications that she was on. She's on omirtazapine, 15, quetiapine, 50 milligrams twice a day, uh, toparol, 100, um, citalopram, and acetaminophen, all of these basically from her, from the nursing home. Okay, so essentially what we were looking at was acute dystonia. Since we've known her prior in the nursing home, we could tell that now how she was contracted was much different than her baseline. Um, she could not eat anything as well. So we also put her on NPO. We were afraid that she was also gonna aspirate. She, uh, for her hypertension, since she wasn't able to take any PO medications, just completely unable to move her jaw at all. We put her on hydralazine 10 milligrams for, blood pressure, uh, for her blood pressure management and for the muscle weakness, essentially we just started her on lactated finger. We wanted to first evaluate and like bring everybody who was required to be on board, et cetera. Um, all the prophylaxis are here. Uh, we put her on anoxaparin for VTE, put her on IV continuous fluids, like I said, and then mild sliding scale as well. Okay. So in one day, essentially, we gave her cogentin. We started her on two milligrams IV push, and she showed some improvement starting on 11-8. Um, so that was after her second dose. But because she was still not eating anything, nutrition was consulted, and we decided to go ahead with an NG tube. Um, we started some feeding through the NG tube. All the pain of the medications were on hold, except like the thiamine, um, the hypertension medications, and the cogentin, which was all given to her um, after the first day, after the two doses of IV push, the cogentin was given to her via the NG tube. And then we consulted psychiatry and neurology. So like I said, essentially the same things. Um, her hypertension medications where we started for her muscle weakness, she was still on lact lactated ringers. We started her on the NG tube feeds with glucerinum uh, for the goal rate of 55 ml. We de 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 all the fluid once the feedings were started. And then we gave her the cogentin uh, for the main cause of her uh, being admitted to us. And then on the second day as well, um, essentially the same things happened. Uh, lactated ringers were also started, um, but yeah, but at a lower weight because she still wasn't eating and her goal rate hadn't achieved yet. We hadn't achieved her goal rate yet for babies. All right, so then we did do a barium swallow on the 11th and that did indicate a swallow problem. Um, so there were no exams prior to this. They couldn't compare it. So the patient was at high risk for aspiration. So, you know, we looked at some more dietary recommendations for her. So she failed her backside swallow test. Now it's been about four more days since we saw her, or she came to us on eight, so about seven more days since we saw her. So now at this point, we know that she'd failed her swallow evaluation. We talked to the family about a PREC-2 possibility since we couldn't continuously put her on NG tube. She couldn't be discharged on an NG tube to the nursing home. So we needed a more viable permanent option. Um, we discussed uh, the family. Once we got them on the phone, they weren't too perceptive about the NG tube. They didn't want to um, do that, which is totally understandable. So we started talking to them about bringing palliative on board. And eventually the family agreed. It's always a hard conversation to have because the family didn't want to let go of the patient. They didn't think that it was necessary, but essentially, we just spoke to them um, in a way that was compassionate and empathetic and helped them understand that there was really like no other forward plan we could do. The patient completely continued to have a pseudo Christmas. It was very difficult still for her to open her jaw. Uh, we couldn't feed her any other way. The NG tube was not a permanent option or a viable one. So it, either it would have to be checked to or we would have to consider palliative care. And eventually they came around. They said, yes, let's go ahead and get some palliative and hospice evaluation. All right. And that's the first day that palliative care saw the patient was on the 15th. Um, they discussed the prognosis with the patient's family, who was the son, um, and the patient's family agreed for hospice and comfort care. So um, the Manson was discontinued because of the recommendation. 
And when we saw her on the 16th, she was doing much better. At this point, she could move her limbs. There wasn't as much pain. There was passive movement as well as active movement. But Kindred Hospice evaluated the patient and accepted her. Um, and since then, she's been under hospice care and she's still being followed uh, by the in the nursing homes by the family medicine team. Thank you. So it's neurology team here already. Um. <clears throat> yeah, I know, but it's, it's not showing. I'm not sure. But it's not showing. Yeah. No, it's not showing. This one? This one? I don't know where I'm at. Where the... This one? This one for the children. Yeah, where's the mouse? Wait. This one? You see it? Where is the mouse? This one. Even though, why is there? Why can I see the mouse? Just look at the neighbor right here. Yeah. You know, but we can't see the, the mouse. That's the whole thing. Really? Like, I don't see the mouse. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's okay. We'll just have to guess where the mouse is. But now we need to share this. So. Oh, it's no, not so it's it's on, I don't know. Make full screen if you think. No, here, share. right? Yeah, but it's better if you do when it's full screen. Oh, it's okay. Because what happens if you make full screen, it won't keep sharing. Oh, just, uh, right now, now she puts new share. Can they see it? No, this is what they're saying. No, no, no. Right? no. It's share. Is, uh, are you able to see the screen, sir? The presentation? Uh, no. Okay. Not, you know what? I'm not. Ask them. Ask the people in the way. Okay, you got it. Can you see? Yes, I can see it. Thank okay. you. Go for it. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Maria Belen Solis. I am TBY1. Thank you for the opportunity to present this in this conference for a long time. I will talk about any stage of dementia. Um, first, I want to to give you an introduction with some important factors of dementia. Dementia currently affects over 15 million people globally, and this is estimated to increase to 152 million by 2050. That is a, a big number, so we need to uh, know a lot of, uh, we need to know very well how to treat, how to manage dementia, because it's a, a very common disease. Uh, according to the latest uh, World Health Organization Global Burden of Disease Report, dementia is the four main cause of disability among, among people aged 75 and older. That is very well known for all of us, I think. The independent contribution of dementia to mortality is currently difficult to assess because, as we know, people with dementia commonly eat elderly people, so if these people tend to have multiple comorbidities, so you don't know for sure which one is the cause of mortality. So I have a question for you, um, what is dementia? Do you have any idea of the definition of dementia? Any, any of you, any of you can want to participate? Participating in the cognitive uh, function, mm -hmm. it depends on the cognitive function of the patient. Exactly. So, so there are a lot of uh, definitions in the in the website of dementia, but I think that is a very good um, and I choose this one. Dementia, dementia is a general term for loss of memory, language problem solving, and other thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with daily life. 
So it's important to uh, to have in mind that there are um, many classifications of the dementia, but the, I think the most important thing is to classify the dementia like progressive, non-progressive, and reversible. What is why why I think that because uh, there are a lot of causes of reversible dementia that you can treat and the treatment can improve if you treat well. For example, depression and anxiety you can treat with antipsychotic, with anxiolytic, with antidepressants. You can treat multiple medical conditions can that can can cause dementia, metabolic problems, medication side effects. Also, it's very important to check that when you admit a patient, especially an inpatient, infection and NPH, that is a very common counsel for neurology, NPH and for neurosurgery for sure. So it, uh, th these are the common causes of reversible dementia that you can treat uh, and the patient can reverse this, this disease, this cognitive impairment. And there are, all, uh, uh, there are two others that is progressive, that's not common is Alzheimer's uh, disease, Dementia with low body, low, low, low body that is associated with Parkinson, frontal temporal dementia, vascular dementia, Parkinson disease dementia per se, and other degenerative dementia. Non progressive dementia is important to know because it's traumatic brain injury can cause this anoxia and vascular, like a single stroke, especially if the stroke is in the temporal lobe can cause dementia because if the cognitive is there, there is a case. So um, when I was uh, reading about this topic, I found a lot of difficult, a lot of amount, uh, a big amount of uh, tools that you can use to assess dementia, but I think this table summarized the best one for me. I don't know, I want your opinion, like palliative care. But uh, the most common tool that everybody knows about that is minimum cell standard test that everybody knows that is over 30, that the cutoff is uh, more than 24. It's most widely used, this in the sign for those fluent in English and with a great uh, eight education, at least eight of the system. And there are a lot of, uh, but what I want to focus here is that you need to know and differentiate when a patient is in which state of dementia is the patient because you can access and you can use the minimental in a patient with any stage of dementia so the next slide is the stage of dementia so uh, i i choose the uh, i put this uh, these two images because uh, I found that functional assessment and staging is the best one to assess and differentiate when a patient has at any stage of dementia. Why I say that? Because the stage is basically defined by the cognitive level of the patient. So you have in stage one, like no cognitive decline. So you can assess the patient like a little, no memory loss, but you can see the patient like um, is not a fully conscious. So the number two is number two is very mild cognitive decline. An individual has normal forgetfulness linked with aging. So you can compute and you can define very well that. So number three is mild cognitive decline. So the patient shows signs of mental decline that are not. <laughs> so it's very important that you need to ask the family. You know, ask the relatives or ask the the person who who are in charge who who is in charge with the with this patient. The stage four moderate cognitive decline that is um, when the patient has trouble socially and begins to withdraw from family and friends. That is very important to say. And if a stage five moderately severe cognitive decline that the patient has a major memory loss and needs some assistance with daily activities. That is important uh, to ask if the patient can sit by themselves or no. It's important. Severe cognitive decline needs considerable assistance with daily activities and also uh, don't remember names of close relatives. And seven is the end stage of dementia, number seven. When you look for a fast, that is a disease test, 
you can divide the seven in A to F. And that is, um, that is important because you can access very uh, deeply this. A seven A is a speech ability limited to about a uh, half thousand intelligible words. Seven B intelligible vocabulary limited to a single word. Seven C ambulatory ability loss. Seven D ability to see that loss. Seven E ability to admire loss, and seven F ability to hold up head loss. It means that the patient is ready. Function, yeah. So uh, some important facts for any stage of dementia is that many people with dementia may never reach the advanced stages and may die from other cause earlier in the trajectory. As I told you, people have, have um, a lot of comorbidities in this age. Advanced, advanced dementia lasts an average of two years, and that is a, it is an average. So many people with advanced dementia can die early. Uh, usually, life expectancy is also the basis to determine access to the U.S. Medicare hospice benefit, which require an estimated sur survival of six months or less, as we have been asked in a lot of the studies. So, infection and eating problems were were the common complications for these patients. Forty-one percent of uh, of any of dementia people. Had pneumonia, 51 febrile episodes, 86 eating problems. So it's important to talk about that. Hospitalization are traumatic for patients with advanced dementia and often unnecessary. So we need to classify which one we want to hospitalize or which one doesn't need. Okay. Hospital, hospital transfer should be avoided unless clearly needed to achieve the desired goals of care. That is important. So eating problems. So that is a very tricky question when you have a patient with dementia because you really need to put a, put a PEC tube or nasogastric tube as in the case that you decide to put. I have been reading a lot of articles and they decide that there is not necessary to put PEC tube or nasogastric tube to see the patient unless the patient has a severe problem to swallow because the next it's better that the patient, can, someone can assist and can, can assist to feed them. Because when you feed the patient, they can taste the food, the, the food they can develop the emotional, uh, emotional behavior with that, and it's better. They, they, they are happy when they can feed my mom. So it's. <laughs> So infection is another important thing to talk about in the in the scene of dementia because people, uh, I always try to, to, to have a similarity when a patient is in any stage of dementia is people in elderly with uh, newborns because people in any stage of dementia in elderly people doesn't, um, doesn't give you a lot of signs or symptoms of, the, of their diseases, it means like, they they didn't say like oh, I have fever I have lower abdominal pain so you didn't know if they you don't know if the patient has a UTI for sure or no so you need to clarify that very well because maybe you are treating a bacteria symptomatic and it's not necessary and that is the the most common cause of treatment. Uh, of this kind of patient so when you suspect urinary tract infection is is this from up to date, you need to uh, you need to figure out if the patient has a folate or not folate because you know that the folate has a, a give you a, a high risk of a UTI. So you need to figure out that, and you need to figure out if, you, if the patient needs or no a folate also. So um, these are the, the reference that you can classify the patient has or no because. As I told you, they, they don't give you the enough symptoms. So you can follow this, this table and you can say that, ah, okay, the patient has a temperature over a 38.9 a grade centigrade. So it's a one point. So you can classify this and you can decide when do you, you do you, you really need to treat or not the patient. So. 
And that is the, the main question of this uh, presentation, when you need to continue anti-dementia treatment or chronic medications. So there are a lot of uh, publications that a consensus panel of experts have identified medications that are inappropriate in advanced dementia. That means that there is very limited evidence to support the administration of dementia drugs, including the typical donepecil, rivastigmine, galantamine, memantine in patients with advanced dementia. So uh, for patients with advanced dementia already on this, uh, that are already on, on these drugs, it may be reasonable to discontinue them and only restart them in the event of patient decline. So you don't need to give them chronic medication because you just need the patient with in a state of dementia, usually do, you just need to keep them happy, if I can say that that word. So you don't need if they don't need to be treated by chronic conditions and also with a with um anti-dementia medication. So that is the main thing that we need you need to keep you. In my, that's all. Thank you. Any questions? Any comments? Will it open for questions? Um, no, that's fine. Any, any questions? I see. So probably... Let's start with the any questions from the room, and then I'll open it to the Zoom. Okay. Any questions? I have a question. I think there was a, a debate about whether or not to treat patients with dementia who have asymptomatic bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, because clinically, we can't get any information from the patient. So ethically, are we should we go ahead with treatment or not? What yeah, I'd like put in my presentation. There are very good uh, table in us today that you can follow, and there are signs and symptoms of bacteria that you can. Say that, that the patient can say to you, like I have a lower abdominal pain, but you can see like the cold, the heart rate, the fever. The, there are a lot of another symptoms that you can observe in order to see your health. Do you have any indication, any specific medication that you are going to start in advance initial or any new one? The anti dementia medication, they are not uh, recommended. They didn't recommend because, as I told, as, as you know, as the medical medication is just to um, let um, the patient um, or let the disease not progress. So it's not a, a real thing. You know, that doesn't mean that the patient can be cured. Okay. Okay. You can be using medication like that every well on the mountain. And we, we only continue the medication. So we see the patient the same, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the question is how to evaluate that patient to see if there is any progression other than what we did. Imagine the patient has already dysphagia, is incontinence based mm -hmm. on too fast. So mm -hmm. you keep the patient mm -hmm. on the medication he's taking or you start stopping the medication. You start stopping the medication okay. according to the consensus and the publication that I have read yeah. Yeah. of the medication. There's no reason to continue. Any questions from the people on Zoom? You can unmute yourself and ask. You want to open, you want to just uh, stop sharing? Mute. No questions? Yes, based on, on the questions that you already mentioned, you know, when we have an advanced dementia patient, we always keep in mind the comfort measures. Um, keep mm -hmm. the patient comfortable. So if the patient is having the symptoms, you know, the stress, pain, cost of the so that's probably the best time to treat the patient. Yes, to treat also because that's going to be our most important goal. No? If the patient is asymptomatic, it is uh, probably when I observate and discuss with the family, no? because all of us have to align with the patient, especially with family values. And what we look for that. That's a uh, key point. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. De Arma. I am a hospice and palliative care fellow. And thank you for being here. And today I'm going to talk about palliative approach of a patient with advanced dementia.
Okay, as Dr. Ross explained before, uh, dementia is divided in seven stages depending on the cognitive decline, where one and two, they're very mild or there's no cognitive decline. Stage three, which could be considered mild cognitive impairment, but as all we know, not everyone with mild cognitive impairment is going to progress to Alzheimer's disease. And then there are stages four to seven that is going to divide dementia into mild, moderate, and severe or very advanced dementia. So why is important to know this classification? Because when do we consider that palliative care is appropriate uh, for a patient with advanced dementia. As all we know, dementia is called the 10 years disease. So it's about year four or five when the patient start, start uh, showing the, the more declining. So it's when they start to uh, being unable to be independent in their activities of daily living. So we consider that this could be a good moment to involve palliative care in the management of a patient with uh, advanced dementia. It could be provided as early, as soon as the, the diagnosis is made, but it's more proper, most appropriate to start uh, considering palliative care in a stage around stage four. So when a patient is unable to feed themselves, to bath themselves, to even ambulate, that's a good moment to start uh, considering palliative care in a management of a patient with dementia. And why, why do, I mean, you could say, why do we involve palliative care in a patient with dementia? And it's because uh, when we have a consult with any patient, but specifically in a patient with dementia, uh, as everyone knows, we have the goals of care conversation. And in the goals of care conversation, it's important to discuss not only with the patient, but also with the family, the disease trajectory. What's the prognosis of the patient and how is it going to be the trajectory of the disease? It's important to let them know which are the most common complications like peg feeding, like at what point they maybe are not going to be able to ambulate anymore or they're going to be incontinent, bladder and bowel incontinent. And just to let them know for them to be prepared because uh, this is a very long disease. So a, a, um, I mean, discussing this in advance help them to be prepared for what's going on later. And also help us to align the care to meet the patient wishes, not only the family wishes, but also the patient wishes. So that's why it's important for the goals of care to be done early in the disease, to let the patient participate in the future management of their own condition. Also, it's important because we need to discuss with them the cold status and their wishes regarding cold status, the psychosocial management, advanced care planning, and also because we in, I mean, we participate in symptom management. So regarding symptom management uh, in palliative care, we use this uh, tool, which is the Edmonton Symptom Assessment System. And we manage, of course, any symptom that the patient can have, but mainly we manage pain. And, and it's important, pain is important in a patient with advanced dementia, because even when they're not able to verbalize, they are usually in pain. It could be because of the wounds or maybe because of the contractures, but they are in a lot of pain. Also, we address tiredness, drowsiness, as you can see there, nausea, lack of appetite, shortness of breath, depression, anxiety, uh, wound care, behavioral disturbances, like the doctor uh, explained it. And, and it's important, the, the symptom management in the, in the patient with dementia. Um, so when we're discussing the goals of care, this is not a unique conversation that we're going to have with the patient and with the family. This is a conversation that needs to be updated anytime that there is a progression in the disease or anytime there is a change in the prognosis of the disease. So it's not the same, for example, the goals of care conversation that we're going to have early in the disease when the, this phase could be restorative phase. And the goals of care at this point is going to be directed, not toward cure because it cannot be cured, but maybe to um, 
to prolong the disease remission and to, to try to remove the patient to, to be uh, in a stable level of, of function. And at this point, the life-sustaining treatment and the artificial nutrition and hydration, or CPR, are given as needed. Then, as the disease uh, advances, and we change to the next phase, which is the comfort phase, when the life expectancy is supposed to be like months or, or years, the goals of care is going to be modified to comfort, quality of life, and dignity. And then the life prolongation at this point is a secondary objective of the medical treatment. And then the life sustaining treatment are going to be continued only if cessation will result in the premature death or to prevent unpleasant symptoms. Artificial nutrition and hydration at this point is given only if desired and indicated. And the CPR is not recommended, but should be discussed with the patient when the patient is still competent. Because at some point, uh, and the, the treatment of comorbid and new conditions, what is going to happen is that it's going to um, extend the life expectancy, but also it's going to expose the patient to intolerable symptoms related to dementia. And at some point of the management of these patients, the, the focus shifts from the quality of life to the quality of death. So when we advance to the terminal phase, which uh, the death is imminent in few days, maybe or a few weeks, then the goals of care is also um, modify, I mean, favors the comfort, the quality of life, the dignity, but mainly to prevent unpleasant sensations in the patient. As a doctor says, it's just to keep the patient as comfortable as possible. And then the life-sustaining treatment, it are usually stop unless it causes suffering, stopping them. And artificial nutrition and hydration are replaced with hand feeding and mouth care. And at this point, CPR is not recommended, but again, it depends on the patient's wishes and the family. Uh, wishes. Then when we have a patient uh, in this advanced stage, we should start considering hospice for them. Um, it's important to, to know when a patient is eligible for hospice according to Medicare guidelines. So when a patient is with dementia is eligible for hospice, when a patient has a stage seven or beyond, according to the fast scale, which is when the patient is unable to ambulate, is unable to, I mean, it's ADL dependent. Also when the patient is bladder and bowel incontinent, and when there is no consistently meaningful verbal communication, I mean, the patient could have some stereotypical uh, phrases that they can say, but there is their ability to speak is very limited, usually to six or less words, in the, during the day. And the patient should have had one of the following within the past two months, aspiration pneumonia, pyonephritis, septicemia, the cubitus ulcer stage three or four, fever recurring after antibiotics and inability to maintain sufficient fluid and calorie intake. And why is this, is this important? Because when we admit a patient late early, in, in, and it's, it, it's in general for any, for any condition. When we admit a patient early into hospice, hospice is a benefit that is usually, usually only covered for six months, I mean, mainly. So when we admit a patient early and after that six months, the patient is not declining, we need to discharge the patient from hospice. And then later when the patient is going to truly need hospice benefit, it's going to be a challenge because the, the main benefit was already used. So that's why this is a multidisciplinary um, thing that should evaluate when the patient meets criteria or not for hospice uh, admission. Okay, and why, I mean, what are the benefits for admitting a patient in hospice? So when the patient is admitted in hospice, they are going to have an individualized care plan that is going to address all the needs of the patients, hydration, nutrition, skin care, all the symptoms that the patient is going to have. 
It's going to provide care for the patient wherever they live, because remember, this is not, I mean, hospice is not a place, it's, it's a service. So it could be provided at home or in a long-term care facility or in, in a assisted living facility or in an inpatient unit, depending on the needs of the patient, or even at, at, at in the street. I mean, homeless are also eligible for hospice. So also hospice, uh, coordinates the care at every level. So between all the physicians and all the nurses involved in, in, in the care of these patients and the social worker in, in every team of, of um, hospice care, there is a social worker, which is, uh, which is a place an important role, not only coordinating, for example, um, medical supplies or medications to ensure the patient has everything they need, but also, to support the family as we're going to see next. And also because hospice brings emotional and spiritual assistance, not only for the patient, but also for the family. So what hospice does for the family, they offer education and training, educating them on how best to care for their loved ones. They help with difficult decisions because at some point the family needs to make some decisions that are not easy, for example, regarding uh, peg tube or the use or not of antibiotics. And we as a team are there to support their decisions. We're only there to give them information, but we need to respect what are their wishes. So we can recommend, for example, do not use a peg tube, but if the, they decide that those are their wishes, but we need to educate them for them to make good decisions um, for the patients. Also with hospice, they offer a uh, nurse assistant by phone 24 hours a day for seven days a week. Emotional and spiritual assistance, financial assistance, which is very important for the families, because as we said, this is a very long disease. So the social worker again can assist the family with financial planning and financial assistance, not only during hospice care, but also after the death with funeral arrangements. So it's very useful that this um, participation of the social worker. Respite care, which is very important. This is a level of care of hospice that is not for the patient, but for the caregiver. So if at any point the caregiver you know, is burned out, hospice can uh, cover up to five days of inpatient care for the patient so the caregiver can take a break. And also bereavement services, which is important because uh, when when a caregiver has um, been taking care of the patient for too many years, the incidence of depression after the, the I mean depression after the family dies is very high. So the hospice, if it's needed, keep working with them for a year after the patient dies, so they can uh, support them with their grief. Okay, and then this is uh, the way how palliative and hospice can get involved in the, in the care of a patient with dementia. And I wanted to share finally with you this campaign because in this case, we were uh, consulted because it was an advanced dementia case that at that point was having dysphagia and the family was refusing peg tube, so we were consulted. And I wanted to share, this is an American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation campaign which was adopted by American Geriatric Society and the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. And this is regarding the PEG tube, where they do not recommend percutaneous feeding tubes in patients with advanced dementia. Instead, they recommend offer oral assisted feeding. So I invite you to look for this Choosing Wisely campaign because this is an initiative to help patients and family to choose the care that is supported by evidence and that is truly necessary for the patient. And that's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Okay. Now psychiatry team is here. Psychiatry? Okay, then we can go with speech and swallow pathologists.
I do not have a PowerPoint. Don't no worry. It's I was not aware that I needed one. You don't need but, good. but my name is Eddie Ann Freeman, and I'm the speech pathologist uh, for Walking Tom and my associate Joyce, who couldn't be here as a speech pathologist for this work or not. So, um, we've been doing this for a really long time. It's not going to say me. And um, I want to talk about a little bit about the role of speech pathologists in palliative care and hospice. What is our goal? Well, how many of you like to eat? Raise your hand. <laughs> so our goal is to keep our patients eating safely as long as possible, okay? Um, and we want to recommend the best methods for safe nutrition and to work with the interdisciplinary team, which is very important, in feeding the patient to avoid aspiration. How do we do that? Well, we're going to assess the patient in many parameters. Number one, we have to do a cognitive assessment to determine how independent they can be in feeding or if they are even a candidate to, to be fed. As everybody has talked about the stages of, of dementia, we need to keep those in mind, okay? And the swallowing abilities will change as they go from stage to stage to stage. So the initial assessment doesn't mean that that's go going to be the correct thing seven months later. So we need to keep assessing them. Um, so first we're gonna look at the cognitive functioning of the patient. Then we're going to get into the case history. What's important? Well, we want to check, check their past medical history and we assess them. We want to look at their chest films, their brain scans, any information that, that we can get. Okay. Then in our assessment, we're going to do an oral exam. We're going to look at the oral structure. We're going to look at the oral functioning. How well do the lips function? How well does the tongue function? Is there a swallow reflex? Is there not? Is the patient overtly aspirated? So we're going to give them trials. Usually we start with water because if they aspirate water, it's not the worst thing in the world and we're giving them very, very little. If we think that they look reasonably well, we'll evaluate them with a puree food at the bedside. Okay. Then we will determine, well, based on what I'm seeing, can they propel the boluses to the swallow? Do they have a swallowing re reflex? Is it on time? Do they exhibit coughing or throat clearing? Okay, so we're going to look at the risk for aspiration on the oral exam. Depending upon the stage of dementia, we will do a modified barium swallow. As the residents know, it's called a BA swallow modified in the computer, okay? So why do we do it? We do it to predict what is the safest consistency to be feeding that patient. We are trying to avoid head tubes. As we know, that they really don't have a role in prolonging life and they become a burden to, to the caretakers as, as well. But, you know, eating is life and we wanna keep satisfying them as long as possible. In our assessment, we're going to get information from the caretakers and the families. Very important. They're with the patient all the time. They see what is going on during feeding. I have found that in the hospital, the CNAs are my best friends. They tell me everything. 
They're very important. And to discuss the care team, to discuss my recommendations and my care plan with the team, okay? How can we assist the team otherwise? Well, we want to know, we're going to ask, is the person having difficulty swallowing certain types of food? Are they having more trouble with solids, puree, liquids? Do we need to, to see those things? Are there sensory motor impairments? Are they recognizing the bolus when it's put in the oral cavity? An interesting study that has come out recently has said that patients with dementia, something like 82%, do better with carbonated beverages, okay? That's something new. So we should be testing that as yeah. well now. Is there distractibility with the patient? How are we going to bring the patient into task? Can we make adjustments in the care, in the feeding of the patient to make feeding more safe? So those are things that we can assist the team in those questions to answer. What else can we do? We can talk about positioning. We can talk about diet modification. We can talk about hand over hand feeding. What does that do? Well, that keeps the patient participating in the act of feeding as long as possible. There is a big difference in swallowing abilities when a patient is being fed by a caretaker and when they're feeding themselves. Think about it. When somebody puts something in, in your mouth, think about it could be a different amount than, than you nor, normally take. They could process it slower and the risk of aspiration becomes more. We want these people to participate in feeding as long as possible. I also encourage finger food. Finger food works very, very well. Okay. Sometimes when we see trays being brought to patients, we see a whole lot of food on it. Well, when you're having trouble swallowing or you're having cognitive de deficits, that is a big test. For, for them, they look at it and then they go, oh gosh, I can't eat all that. So I usually recommend breaking the food into five small feedings. So it doesn't seem like such a mountain to climb. Uh, they also should be with high caloric content. For that, the nutritionist be becomes my best friend. And we collaborate on what feedings would be best, how to, to maintain your nutrition best. We talk about su suggestions for oral care, oral hygiene, which I can't stress enough. I don't know how many times I go into a room and I see de demented patients and their oral care is not good. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to get infections. They could get MRSA. So we want to stress oral care. You may want to be writing that in your orders. It's very important, at least twice a day. Do we need an artificial saliva substitute in these patients that just don't want to eat? That's something that, that can be extremely valuable. Um, we want to re-evaluate if acute on chronic exacerbation resolves and before making a final recommendation as far as the feeding they should go home with. Um, we want to teach families and caretakers proper positioning amount, rate, and special techniques to feed the patient. 
And those are so important. I just recently had a patient where we did a swallow study on, and the fact that to your patient, correct? And we, we recommended half teaspoons of applesauce followed by water because they exhibited cooling here. And we found when we did the study and we followed the puree with water, he successfully swallowed it, swallowed it, excuse me. We want to teach the staff how to determine risks and distress of the patient for aspiration. And those are basically, is the patient coughing? Is the patient throat clearing? How is their respiratory status? Are they becoming short, short of breath? Do they sound wet in the pharynx? So these are all things that's important to, to determine. Um, then we need to collaborate with the family caretakers and our team. As was mentioned before, a peg tube in this scenario with advanced dementia did not show any value in life, quality of life, reduction, and aspiration pneumonia. So we're taking that off the table if possible, unless the family insists on doing that. So I guess the questions are, depending upon the case, depending upon the stage of dementia at, at their act, what are we gonna do? They fail the swallow study and what are we going to do? I just had had a lady this morning that exactly that happened. In fact, we only did one swallow because it was so severe. We didn't go any further with the study. She's going to go back and the family does not want any tubes. So what are we going to do? Well, we can present to the family that we can keep them comfortable with lemon glycerin swabs or with the little spongy swabs, put in water or juice or coffee to satisfy their taste. Okay. Some families will come to us and say, I don't really care. I want to feed my mother. They need to participate in the care of their family. It makes them feel better like they're not starving. And starving is a, a consideration. And that's why in the past, we did put in pets, okay? Um, so we have to talk with the family and the physician and the team and decide what the family wants to do. I cannot recommend that you give the patient a pureed diet and liquids that are then. We signed on to um, do, do no harm, and that could potentially harm the patient, okay? Um, also, there's a lot of liability involved in doing that. So if the family decides to feed him and everybody's okay with that, we try to make the recommendation that would be possibly more successful, keep them from aspirating for a longer time. That's why we do it in MBS when it's possible. So that's sort of where, where we stand here. It's a very great area of what we're recommending. It's individual to each case, each patient, and um, each physician. And so collaboration, and being part of the team is essential. We can help with these things. And, uh, and we look forward to, to working with you guys. Are there any questions for me? Nobody? Okay.
Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. So we get one zoom back. Yes. Uh, you want to share the screen? Oh, what you can yeah. Bring us up in the top. Good afternoon, actually. Uh, my name is Adar Shetty. I'm a PGY3 resident with psychiatry. Um, I'll just be talking a little bit about the management of the behavioral psychotic symptoms and end stage dementia. Um, it'll be a pretty general topic. We'll talk a little bit about our disease dementia as well. Thank you so much for being a light. Appreciate that. All right. So let's get started. So, first thing before we even go to the pharmacological stuff, we're going to start with non pharmacological treatments. Okay. So, thank you very much. The main thing that we're looking at here, especially in end stage dementia, is the reversible, uh, excuse me, reversible uh, precipitance of agitation. As we know dementia doesn't tend to get agitated. So, specifically, we're looking at Reducing the amount of pain they're in, nicotine withdrawal. Um, looking at their medications, because a lot of these medications do cause them to get restless, to get anxious, and then eventually agitation. Um, and then, of course, undiagnosed medical and neurological il uh, illnesses and their environment, provocative environment. Are they getting bored? Because that's when stuff don't get agitated, or is there too much going on? So being understimulated versus being overstimulated. Um, we found that, you know, especially in End stage uh, dementia, CBT or typical uh, cognitive behavioral therapy isn't going to do a whole lot because the patients don't really want to participate. But behavior management therapy is something different. Um, it's useful in targeting challenging behavioral patterns, specific, uh, specifically agitation, patients wandering, repetitive questioning, you know, why am I here, all of that. So that's always something that we've been trying to use. And there are alternative therapies. Some facilities do have options like this, so light massage aromatherapy, music and dance therapy. Animal assisted therapy, one of my favorites, as you guys can see, and then multi sensory therapy. It's my dog, by the way. So <laughs> if I had late stage dementia, I would actually want her to be around. So. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to go to a simple algorithm on the pharmacological treatment from a psychiatric perspective. Okay. So the first thing is we need to assess the severity of dementia. Are we looking at mild, moderate, or moderate to severe, basically? So with mild to moderate, our main form of treatment is, and this is, you know, preventative, we, we, we all know this, but Acetylcholine um, esterase inhibitors, your dompazil, your rheostigmine, galantamine. Um, when it comes to, I mean, the main things to remember here, your rheostigmine and galantamine are going to be the main, only going to be used for mild to moderate uh, dementia, while you're more severe, that's where you're going to use dompazil over here on the moderate to severe side. And that's where we also talk about NMDA uh, receptor antagonists, such as memantine and amendo. So that's the first step before we even look at the acute episodes. The real, when, before we come into the anxiety, the depression, all of that, this just kind of has something to cover in the meantime. These do help in those situations as well. So that's why we want to make sure that they are being treated with these medications also. Thank you. Now, as you can see, the main thing with the next few sli slides, or slides, everyone, is to combine both the non pharmacological as well as the pharmacological treatment. And what we want to look at are the main symptoms that each patient is exhibiting. As we talked about this previously, each treatment plan is going to be individualized per patient. So let's look at the behavioral clusters that each of these patients could be expressing. Um, the first one that talked about is depression, anxiety, even insomnia. Very common on the mood spectrum, especially in these patients. Your go-to medications here are going to be your SSRIs. You can use other antidepressants, your SNRIs, but we are trying to limit cardiovascular um, complications, and you'll see more of those with the SNRIs as well as your other antidepressants, your MAL inhibitors, and some of your atypicals also. Um, in regards to these medications, I mean, for us, as far as the experience that we've seen clinically, uh, we use the Talipram as well as Sertraline or Zoloft for fairly often. Some things to remember is that even with the SSRIs, you will you do have to do regular monitoring and follow-up because you do see some side effects, especially with the cardiovascular system. Uh, mild bradycardia is very common. Sometimes you'll see um, orthostatic hypotension. So, you know, always remember to have your patients slowly stand up. And we just want to make sure that they're being followed as possible. But these are the safer options to go for. We also use atypical antidepressants, such as our trazodone. Um, you guys are very familiar with that. We use minimum sedation in psychiatry. And 
One common problem I've actually been seeing with one of my patients um, on an outpatient basis is she's got mild spotter right now as far as the her dementia goes, but she's having a real tough time sleeping. So literally staying up all night. So trazodone has been helping her quite a bit. Low doses is where we're seeing uh, the most improvement. And that's kind of a, what you'll see kind of throughout all of our medications. Um, and we'll kind of summarize that at the end as well. Nima. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to continue. So other behavioral clusters that we're looking at, agitation, aggression. This is the real thing we're worried about, right, in acute setting. So first line prevent, prevention is going to be your acetylcholine, esterase inhibitors, your SSRIs, your SNRIs, all that. But what do we do in these acute episodes? I'm not sure if we did a case presentation or not. I'm sorry, I came a little bit late. But I do know in the hospital, what we try to do is use the medications that we have available. In these situations with the acute exacerbation of the agitation and aggressive behavior, we turn to these medications for benzodiazepines. Now, you want to be a little bit careful here. Obviously, there are reactions to benzos, especially in the elderly, but as long as we're being cautious using low doses and using the right uh, medication, that is the one with the right half life, then you're pretty safe. Um, we tend to use um, intermediate acting benzodiazepines, so like your lorazepam, for example, that would be the better option here. When you Go to the, the benzos that have the longer half-life. You are putting your patient at risk for dizziness, fainting, even um, episodes of delirium. So you want to avoid those as much as possible. And then let's talk a little about, uh, I mean, it's rare, but it does happen. Mania or even hypomania in uh, dementia. If I'm not mistaken, this usually happens more often in front of uh, frontal dementia as well as uh, dementia with movie bodies. We've seen them more often, honestly. So then you can turn to your mood stabilizers. It may be a little um, difficult to kind of imagine what a patient, especially someone who is elderly in late stage dementia, looks like with mania, because your typical manic symptoms about being going on shopping spree, having all this extra energy, staying up all night, you may not see that, but you can see parts of it. So you'll see a little bit of insomnia, you'll see the inappropriate behavior at times, a little bit of sexual preoccupation for sure. Um, and then just erratic behavior, sometimes restless as well as agitation, all that kind of comes in. And there, some of the safer options here are going to be our car carbamazepine and as well as uh, the Depakote Diabolprolex. Thank you. And let's talk about psychosis. So yes, this is the next behavioral cluster. So psychosis, um, when, it, when, it, when it comes to antipsychotics, the first thing to remember is that there are no FDA-approved antipsychotic medications for and state dementia over dementia in general. The reason being is that these medications tend to be a little bit risky as far as their adverse effects go. So you are you are kind of um, in that section where you're worried about cardiovascular events. You put the patient at increased uh, risk for cardiovascular events as well as increased mortality. So both those things you got to uh, be aware of. The thing is, in the real world. There is the problem of non-treatment also. So if we don't treat, we are at risk of putting a patient in psychosis as well as agitation and aggressive behavior. So we got to be careful there. If that's the case, then we like to use our second generation antipsychotics, our atypicals, for example. Um, the ones that are most commonly used in very low doses, again, risperidone, use the first one. And then you can use other ones like quetiapine as well as um, Olanzapine, for the most part, we usually have to stick to those, but very low doses, a lot of monitoring, what's going on with that as well. Something else to remember about antipsychotics. Um, the reason why we don't, I mean, why we don't use them as well is that this population is usually very sensitive to the side effect profiles associated with antipsychotics, so your ECS, extraterminal terminal symptoms. The main, oh, sorry. The main thing to really remember here is to uh, distinguish what type of dementia you're looking at. We've seen in trials that there's been a there's been um, the patients with uh, dementia uh, associated with Lewy bodies. Those are the patients. That's the patient population that is very very sensitive to the side effect profile. So you got to be very careful there. But I know it's a little bit hard, especially without an autopsy, to be able to distinguish sometimes. So look at your clinical features. Look for those fluctuations in your mood, as well as the hallucinations, the visual hallucinations, when you work towards the dementia with Lewy bodies. Okay, some important points. I know this is kind of short and sweet, but that's why it's a simple algorithm. But main things, uh, monotherapy. Always, always, always first start. The lowest effective doses. 
Um, if you don't see an effect in about four weeks, uh, that's where you want to start tapering off your medications and trying another option. Combination therapy, um, you can use that if multiple types of behaviors you're seeing your psychosis, your agitation, your depression. If you're seeing multiple things, you will need a very um, um, kind of a combination version of a regimen. And um, yeah, I'm going to submit that on those, but anyway. Continue to reinforce the non pharmacological interventions that we've talked about. Those should never be forgotten. We don't want to rely just on medications. We don't want to knock out these patients completely. Um, use the drug group uh, ranges, pre self explanatory, and then always assess the efficacy and side effects frequently. So, regular monitoring follow up. Control the modifiable, uh, modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. Um, if you're seeing that your patient's improving to the point where you're not seeing those symptoms anymore, you can start removing medications, you know, as much as possible, um, but taper slowly. So three to four months uh, as, uh, as, far, as fast as you want to go. And then um, if you do you know, start to taper off the medication, even if you do it appropriately, just make sure to watch for remission or reemergence of symptoms. And last but not least, these are the high-risk patients that you, know, you want to worry about. These are the ones that are going to have a lot of issues, especially with the monotherapy. So this is where you might see more intensive risk. So vascular misadventures, patients over 85, significant impairments and activities of their daily living, those kind of patients. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Question. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So the beginning is so my question is third party to so um, the, the most common cause of dementia is advanced dementia. We really see the behavior or psychological feature at the end in advanced dementia, correct? So how we can, you know, is it, is it easy to evaluate the patient that, you know, in advanced dementia comes with behavior or psychotic feature to evaluate, to assess uh, regarding depression, anxiety with the assessment tools that we have, or, you know, I told this like, question to see if the patient is manic or hypomanic or... So yeah, our assessment, thank you. Our assessment like, regarding like what we're actually treating would be very similar to how we would see any other psychiatric patient. It isn't. It's not going to make too much of a difference based on what what stage of the dementia they're at. They're still going to have those similar symptoms of anxiety. Like I mentioned before, with the mania, sometimes they are a little bit harder to see, but it's really just seeing how different their behavior is now compared to where they were before. That's what we call their psychiatric baseline. How much they progress in the current state, that's where you really want to look at those clusters of behaviors and see exactly what you're targeting. I would say always start slow, try to treat each symptom like one medication at a time, see what relieves because a lot of these medications will treat multiple clusters at the same time. So you don't want to overload the patient with too many medications on day one, you want to go slowly, step by step. Now, my question is diagnosis. So mm -hmm. uh, you ask the family maybe the questions? That's one thing that we do very um you know very commonly in psychiatry. Our collateral information is very important. So we always look to the family members as well as the caretakers. A lot of the patients that we see are in nursing homes. So we like to see what their day-to-day -day kind of the habits are, how they were before and as to how they progress to the current state they are. And that kind of points you into the right diagnosis a little bit more. Any other questions? Thank you guys. Ah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Manio Haliti Kolo. Uh, so I'm going to get permission to briefly review with you some ethical considerations or complexities that we have generally in the palliative care and mainly in the patients with dementia. Uh, so we in, uh, in ethical issues uh, in the palliative care often raised because we, we wanted to know how much and what kind of care we need to provide for the patients who are at the end of their life or who have limited life expectancies. Because the pitfalls that we have in the management of these patients, it's very important to go through the ethical issues. What are the pitfalls? The pitfalls mainly are under and over treatment. Under treatment <laughs> mainly goes through the don't providing the comfort measures while the patient has end-stage dementia 
and maybe for the patients who are in the facilities. And all treatments that we usually see are for the patients that they are in advanced dementia, they are still taking many medications, and uh, they, they, they are not going to benefit more from, and they might even receive some interventions that might be futile or might be potentially inappropriate. The main goal for you know approaching going to the ethical complexities or issues uh, in this kind of patients is because we are, we are going to respect the patient dignity. We see the patient as a person who okay, we, we are going to respect the patient autonomy. So and we are going to achieve all the best interest for the patient and prevent patient from his or her own harmful decisions. We know that dementia generally and the main cause of dementia is a disease, and recently we named it as a neurodegenerative or neurocognitive disease because of the stigma that it uh, comes with its name and makes some barriers when we wanted to communicate with the people and with the, when the patients and family go, you know, have some, uh, you know, uh, difficulties when they wanted to open to uh, their, their diagnosis to, to their to, the, you know, to their friends to get help. <coughs> so dementia is a clinical syndrome, is a progressive clinical syndrome, degenerative disease characterized by global cognitive decline and impairment, impairment that it causes loss of individuality and autonomy. That's important. And it had different stages. In different stages of dementia, we have different level of the functional status functional performance. We see the patients in different stage of impairment in decision-making capacity. They might have some, some behavioral or psych psychological symptoms in different severity. And at the end, we might we see the patient that is mentally incompetent. So in different stage, our action approach gonna be different. The goals of care discussion gonna be different. The plan of the care that we have to pay for the patient is different. So the key point here, the key principle is to understand and to remember that the patient with dementia, they are the same equally valued people throughout their course of the illness, regardless of the extent of the, ch ch of the changes in their mental ability. There are four ethical reasons or four ethical principles. Everybody knows is respect for autonomy, benef beneficence, non maleficence and justice. Respect of autonomy is informed patient right to make decision. The point is informed patient is not only right to make a decision. So we need to inform the patient with the facts and all the truth regarding its disease, if it is curable or is not curable, or the disease which is trajectory, the prognosis, and all the plans and, you know, the treatment plans that we have. The beneficence is actually the rule that mandates all the physicians, health professions, to go to the best interest for the patient. And then maleficence, maleficence is the instruction that we have to do no harm. And justice is providing for providing you know, the, whole, uh, the healthcare resources for every people equitably and at the same time treat every people, every patient well and fairly. But the thing is, you know, when we, not always we can uh, go through all these ethical rules for each patient. And many times these rules, they go to an odds with each other. So let me bring some examples for you. Here we have a case with Alzheimer's disease, who is in the nursing home and he need, she needs help with the feeding, but she, she is not capacitated at this time. But before when she was capacitated, she signed post and she refused to receive any artificial treatment. Now the patient refusing eating. So we call the family, next slide, they call the family to see what, what they want to do. And 
here we see the son is refused, is uh, you know, neglecting the mother wishes for refusing any artificial treatment and goes to accept, you know, the uh, NG tube feeding. So here the son actually didn't respect, respect the mother autonomy and doesn't show the loyalty or support to his mother wishes. And he is thinking that he is helping his mother based on the rule of beneficence and helping her to prolonging her life and improving her quality. But we know that is against that the patient wishes. And based on the course, we are going to, to talk to the family and finally go to the patient's dishes based on the documents that we have it and his course is a kind of advanced directing the instructions that the patient signed when she was capacitated here is another case that is interesting that we can see how we can really go through all these ethics and you know make sure that the patient has in the right way so here is a man who was fighter pilot in the during the World War II, and during or all his life, he was dependent. He was independent. Now he has advanced dementia. He comes for annual evaluation. We see him. He is not. He is not able to, to provide us his address, his current day, the season day, the time, and his um, based on our evaluation, mental, any mental status that we check is eleven over thirty. So at this time, we talk to the next slide. We talk to his three daughters and discuss his situation. Here, the decision of the, the daughters are important. So go to the next slide. So here we see that the, the daughters decided to have to keep him in his own life to be aligned in his home life, you know, in his home home, uh, his own home during the day in some hours just to respect his philosophy to be independent and at the same time they respect their father autonomy and also the respect beneficence okay next slide another thing that another thing that usually uh, we have to handle in the cases of dementia when we diagnose the patient with dementia, it's not easy to talk to the patient and family about, you know, the diagnosis. But the thing is, based on autonomy and the beneficence, we and our personal, uh, you know, believe we, want, we are going to talk, we, we wanted to talk to the family. But sometimes their family asks us, don't talk to the patient because the patient might get in a stress or might go to some kind of anticipatory bereavement, or might be well and don't continue with the treatment if he or she knows that she has a disease that is really incurable, and at some time in his life, she or he is going to be demented incapacitated. So it's not easy. So who is going to decide in here about the patient? So we know the rule of autonomy. It's gonna be family, I'm going to be the patient finally. But before what, like pattern, the, the, the paternalism, we have healthcare paternalism in the US system. system. We went to do the diagnosis to, to, to decide about the patient's healthcare based on the paternalism. We, you know, we had, when we had a patient come with the respiratory arrest, the cardiovascular arrest to the uh, emergency room, based on the paternalism, we had to do. CPR, but right now we have the opportunity to talk to the patient and family to see if they wanted to do the resuscitation or if they don't want it, or what was their wishes in the past. So there is a, there is a complexity or an issue here but based on autonomy. Sometimes we see the healthcare professionals, they, they actually uh, hide behind of this rule of autonomy when we wanted to talk to the family or the patient about the diagnosis, they provide a bunch of information, the facts truly to the patients and family 
but they don't make suggestions or recommendation and leave the family with lots of burden, you know, burden of the disease and the decision here. So the recommendation is we, as a, as a physician, we need to have to participate in decision making and we need to provide our recommendation and our suggestion. But the thing is, we, are, we don't need to provide always recommendation that patient doesn't benefit. And it backs to the rule of palliative paternalism. The palliative paternalism says that if you see that the patient doesn't benefit of some intervention, interventions or treatment that might be futile or might be actually inappropriate on that stage of the disease, so you don't need to offer the patient. So it's based on this rule, these two moral rules. One is utilitarian consequentialist view. So we put the benefits in one side and put the risks on the other side to see which one is weight. And then talk to the patient about the, the options that we have it. Another one is the ontological view is about the withdrawing and withholding the treatments. Then there is an argue between the, the, the physicians and the family, why the family wanted to continue, but it is the duty of the physician to recognize that some, go to another slide, that some of the treatments option are really futile. So we have futility. It's medical, the medical futility defines and an excessive medical intervention that stands little uh, prospect of changing the ultimate clinical outcome. So as a physician, it's our duty to recognize that this option is futile right now. So even the family, they want it, and even sometimes patients want it because of the autonomy, they are not going to offer that or to use that is not only because of the cost to the system, because of the, the principal ethic of justice too. Go to another slide. So in 2015, the five society that we have here, they finally state, they define the, the term of futility. And it says that it really happens that we, I actually, we are, we are going to do some interventions that that intervention definitely cannot accomplish the intended physiological goal. Another slide. But there is another term that is potentially inappropriate treatment. For potentially inappropriate treatment, we know that if we give the patient that treatment, the patient might shout and say to you, oh, he, he he is a little bit better in, in the terms of symptoms, for example, but we really believe as a clinician that competing ethical considering, justifying that this ethical consideration of justifying, we know that this treatment not gonna provide benefit, real benefit for the patient, not gonna change the outcome. So we are not going to even use the potential inappropriate treatment. In dementia, so we know that dementia has at least three stages in this way. So we know that we have a long you know, time that is the patient is in preclinical or asymptomatic period and then goes to minimal change uh, this, uh, uh, in impairment and minimal cognitive impairment and then goes to, uh, to advanced disease or to Alzheimer's. This is mainly uh, is for Alzheimer's disease. So the question is here at the, the time that the patient is on advanced Alzheimer's disease based on the futility and you know potentially inappropriate treatment, how, we, um, how much we are allowed ethically to use different treatments that we have it. If you go through the treatments of the Alzheimer, you see we have a bunch of researchers that says about you know this is modifying medications that we have right now. And it's a big question, ethical question here that we, while we know that even with using that, the response are unsatisfactory. Okay. 
So here uh, we talked about many of these. Uh, so we need uh, we need to balance. Uh, it's very difficult actually to balance the concerns for patients' welfare with dementia at the same time keeping the patient independence. But I brought an example for you. It's possible when you go to talk to family to and explore the patient and family goals and values. And uh, so the next slide. So generally, when we want to apply all these ethics to the patient with dementia, first we need to, to make sure how much is our understanding of the disease, what are the clinical and legal tools to assess the manifestations of the disease? So we need to know the conceptions of decision, decisional capacity and models that we have for, for uh, capacity assessment. What is the advanced state planning when we apply advanced state planning? When you use, you know, when you start to talk about the advanced state planning in the dementia patients, and we need to actually go to the family because their role is really crucial in providing and in maintaining quality of life for the patients. And also the societal conception of dementia is very important. We know that the skill is a big stigma, dementia, and also individual or personal acceptation of aging is very important. And another concept that brings a big ethical issue here is abuse, the risk of abuse that might have been physical, financial, different kind of abuse, many neglections that these patients, you know, might suffer, especially in the facilities. Okay. So, first, to uh, go to another slide, we have two things that uh, I'm going to briefly review that. So, we have two things we have capacity and competence. So, competence is being able to understand information relevant to a treatment decision and to appropriate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision or lack of a decision. So competence is being able to understand this whole. But what the patient is able to understand, then we go to evaluate the capacity that is the, the level or the degree of understanding. That is important to know the difference between the capacity and competence. Back to the slide. So here, when we wanted to do the decision-making capacity, we have different evaluations of different decision-making capacities. So it's only for getting consent form for a procedure, you know, for a treatment. But it's not the same when we go through the other things, like when we wanted to make sure that the patient is capacitated to sign, for example, the power of attorney, uh, you know, documentation or even the last documentation. These are not the same. This is mainly where it's when we wanted to get the consent from the patient. So we are going to evaluate the patient's functional ability, ability to express the, his choice, ability to understand the information we provide, ability to appreciate significance of the information and relevance to self, and ability to manipulate intervention and rationally make a decision. The thing is, in the patient with dementia, even if they are in the early stage, it not, might not be easy, but the thing is we can, as a physician, provide the facts because they have some memory problem, but we provide some facts for them. When we provide some facts for them, it's easier for them to make a decision, to participate to the decision. So it's, we need to be careful when we actually want it to assess the, the decision-making capacity. We usually when get agreement, don't go through the cause of agreement. You don't ask, you know, when the patient has a bump, a skin bump, you go and say, okay, I want to remove that bump. And the patient says, okay. But you, usually we don't say why you agree. But when the patient is disagree, we want it to go to see why the patient refuses and find out the reason. So it's a kind of bias here. When the patient agrees, we must to know why the patient agrees. So if we find out that the reason, the reason that the patient has behind that is really reasonable, we can say that the patient is capacitated. So make sure about it. Okay, so go to the next slide. Um, another one, let's see. Okay, uh, here we wanted, there is a, another one that is a, 
uh, no name the Johnson's forward model for decision making, uh, um, medical decision making. Actually, it says how we appreciate the ethical uh, principles while the, we ask the patient to make a decision. So medical indications, we talk about the medical indications. So we are using the principle of beneficence and non maleficence when we talk about the medical indications. When we see the what is the patient and family preference, preference, we are looking to the principle of respect to autonomy. When we go to the quality of life, we are looking for the benefits, malbenefits, and autonomy all. And we are going to the contextual, uh, contextual features. We actually looking at the loyalty and fairness and justice. So. In summary, the thing is when we diagnose the patient with dementia, go to advanced care directly if the patient is capacitated. So the thing is palliative must be involved in the diagnosis of dementia as soon as the patient diagnosed with dementia. Because at that time, the patient might be capacitated and might help us you know, in decision making on that time. So advanced care directive, the main thing that we have in advanced care directive is power of autonomy. Who's going to be a durable power of autonomy? And advanced, advanced directive instructions that might be five dishes, might be actually living will, might be ports. But let me explain something here. We have some terms. We have durable power of autonomy. We have surrogate. We have the term of proxy. What are the difference here? When we talk about the durable power of attorney, we are talking about a legal document that the patient signed. It's signed by the patient with two witnesses by a legal person, by a principal. When we talk about the surrogate, so we are talking to see who is decision making. The, the main decision making always is the person, is the patient. If the patient is not capacitated, the first decision maker is guardianship if the patient had court divine guardianship. All the decisions go to guardianship. But other than that, we go to next of the kin, like based on hierarchy that we have, for example, in Florida, and mainly in all the states that the, the things that we have, it is the spouse, then children, then uh, parents, then sisters and brothers, siblings, and finally the close friends. And after all of these, it's going to be a social uh, case worker or clinical worker that we uh, actually have in the hospitals. But the, the proxy is going to be the, old, the whole, the, in, the, the term of the proxy. The proxy can be guardianship, the proxy can, can be next of the king, the proxy can be the social worker. But just to make sure that we are, we know the definition of these terms. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any? No, it's probably going to be a few days. The presentation is going to be a, you know, this is a very difficult, as like everybody mentioned, this is a great area. There are not too many clinical trials. Uh, so it's a, but it's important, no? It's basically to find out what the patient or family decision. So when we have a patient with moderate dementia, it's always good to start having this kind of that conversation. You know, in my prior life, uh, uh, we used to have um, involved uh, any patient who had moderate dementia. We used to come to the clinic, bring a social worker, have a caregiver, and start having discussion because when the patient crashed, it's very difficult for physicians and caregivers. But we know the same year trajectory, especially in the Alzheimer's dementia, that we have the opportunity. But we have, you know, we need to know exactly what's going to be done. So hopefully, this kind of presentation is going to help kind of a little bit more what's going to be the best decision, and we're open for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? So uh, we, we um, this is great. So this is really a good, a good, a good grand round. So we're going we're gonna to try to do these monthly, uh, and hopefully other specialties that are interested in uh, doing something together, let us know, and we'll, we'll plan it.
We have a guest speaker coming up. Uh, George, uh, yeah, George, you want to introduce? Yeah, Dr. So Philip Abreu. I think you guys saw his lecture about uh, maybe three weeks ago. Abdominal uh, transplant surgery at the University of Miami. So, so what I want to do is for the people that are on Zoom, uh, you, you if, if you're only here for the palliative care, you can log off. If you're interested in the next topic, you can stay. I'm going to stop recording. Uh, this recording will be.